Amen. Amen. We are here to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Turn to someone and say, Happy Resurrection Sunday. We like to say that versus Easter. Easter's okay, but Resurrection Sunday is why we are here. If you're new with us, my name is Chris Pate. I'm the lead pastor here, and we are wrapping up our Unshakables series today as we've been going through specific doctrines that uphold our faith, like sin and salvation, lordship, obedience, Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts, church life, generosity, all of these different things that uphold the faith of Jesus that we can rest on and be assured on as we build our life on the rock and not on the sand. And we wrap up today with the most important, even as Kenny said so well earlier, the resurrection of Jesus. If you've been going through our purple book, we've had purple book challenge. If you don't know what this is, get a free book. You come to church, you get several things free. We're here to bless you. And uh, you can take one of these cards back to the lobby and you get a free book. And it's just our way of helping you explore the faith, know what these fundamental truths of the faith are. Today, the fundamental truth of the resurrection, again, is why we gather not just this Sunday to celebrate, to renew our vigor, our life, our reason why we're here, but hopefully every day. One of the frustrating symbols that I see in our culture is a cross with Jesus still on it. I get the reasoning in some sense because you wanna understand the, what, what it took, the excruciating pain, but what we celebrate today is he's not on it. He's not there, so that symbol of torture that would be horrific 2,000 years ago to wear around your neck. Today is a symbol of freedom, symbol of liberty, a symbol of celebration because he's not there anymore. He's not dead. In fact, many kings would come and go throughout the centuries and throughout even Roman, Greek, whatever, even Hebrews would have kings and they would pass and that king would die. And then what they would do is they would send out messengers to preach good news to all the cities, not that he's dead, but that a new king is here now. Maybe it was his son or someone else, or maybe the king was killed and a new king came and they would send out and they used the word gospel, good news to tell everybody a new king is here. But it was inevitable that king would die and then a new one would replace him. And this is what's so powerful about the resurrection of Jesus is that he died, but he resurrected to say this, I am king forever and forevermore, and I am king of kings and Lord of lords, that you can't kill me, you can't stop the kingdom I bring, no matter what you do, because he is God, he is king forever. This is what we get to celebrate today. This is going to be a serious message, as well as hopefully a hopeful message, because I do wanna talk about the fact that we celebrate this today, but really every day we should live as if we serve a risen king. Yet unfortunately, if we look at our lives oftentimes, we still act like, maybe sometimes we still believe that Jesus is dead on that cross. In fact, let's go to Luke chapter 24, our main verses today, one through 12, we are gonna look at as Jesus has been dead for two days. And on the third day, the women disciples got up to prepare and to go to the tomb. And we read and see, Luke tells us this, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. 
And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. Of all the accounts, the Gospels, the Gospels being Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, this is Luke's account, and it's the only one that tells us that when the women came to the tomb, there were two men, they were angels. They're dressed in this brightness, gleaming lightning, and they asked them a question. What did they ask them? We read it. Why do you look for the living among the dead? This was a rhetorical question. It was a counseling question. They're not looking for information. Oftentimes when angels or Jesus is asking a question, he's not going, hmm, I need the help of you to tell me information I do not know. In fact, he knows and what the angels were trying to do was push them and show them the error of their ways, of their thinking, of their beliefs, of their actions, show them how they were disoriented to who Jesus really was. And these were people that spent years with him, like us often who can hear about Jesus and yet misunderstand completely the reason that he came. This was kind of a glorious rebuke. It was joyful, it was loving, it was therapeutic maybe, but it was out to heal, not just to hurt, but make no mind. It, they were rebuking the women. These women, they had made this mistake. And I wanna show you today, we're gonna to cover three different ways that we can treat Jesus as if he were still dead today. Because you know, you can still live as if he's dead. One day a year we celebrate, and yet how do we actually functionally live unto a risen savior. The first one we'll cover is they made the mistake as we do of denying the very miracle of the resurrection. The second, we're gonna, we're gonna look at in a second, they made the mistake not only of denying the miracle of the resurrection, but the meaning of it. They missed the point. And then third, they make the mistake of denying the spiritual reality of this resurrection. Let's look at the first thing that we see in the scripture the number one denying the miracle of the resurrection. They came to the tomb, assuming and believing it was gonna be full. They denied the very miracle that they had heard him speak about, but how often, especially men, we're bad at this, our wives say something really, really important, like you should pick up the kids at four o'clock and you forget. <laughs> something very, very important, and yet it, it's like you never even heard it right? Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I'm already hurting you. <laughs> but they heard this message Jesus told in his intimate moments, the disciples, and yet they had no idea what happened. Immediately, they show us that they believed Jesus was among the dead. They understood he was like maybe all other founders of religions, Really, all other major religions, their founders, we know, are dead. If you want to seek them, you can read their writings, you can try to abide by their guidance and other people that follow them. 
But that's it. What the angels were basically saying, and it's on the screen to the women, is this. If you treat Jesus as if he's like all the other founders, if you treat him as a brilliant teacher or a wonderful teacher, his truth will go marching on, but he doesn't go marching on. If you treat him like that, you'll never fully find him. He's not there. He's risen. Luke begins by showing us this tomb that's empty and the bones are gone and Jesus is really, really risen. Before we move on, I just wanna ask everyone here, how many of us make that mistake? Or maybe at one point we did make that mistake. That mistake goes like this. Well, I believe Jesus' teachings are wonderful. Even uh, atheistic historians will believe that Jesus was a real man. In fact, they might say, I find Jesus a very inspiring person. Our culture likes the idea of Jesus and loves to use him for their own gain, typically, whether it's political or ideological. They say, I really try in many ways to honor and respect him and so on, but I, I don't know about this primitive idea that he actually miraculously got up from the grave can't believe that. In our culture, they might say, I'm a modern person. I'm very thoughtful. Back then, people were dumb and credulous. They were primitive. They believed all sorts of things like this. We can't believe these things now. Maybe there's some kind of spiritual resurrection that people believe, but a literal, miraculous, out of the tomb, I can't do that. I'm a realistic person. Here's the great irony in this mistake is it passes itself off as if it's just modern and current to believe that. The fact is most commentators understand this and Luke is understanding this. What's why he's writing what he wrote. He's specifically addressing that very mistake. He's helping people recognize this. And this is what you need to understand. It's always been impossible to believe Jesus rose from the grave. It's always been difficult. It, I, I would even say it, it was more difficult at that time in some ways if it wasn't true because of the eyewitnesses accounts and because they saw death more than us. Even some of the arguments that Jesus really didn't die, he faked it or it was someone else as if they were so dumb that they didn't know what death looked like. They saw death more regularly than we do, unless you're in a hospital work constantly, you know what death looks like. Today, one of the reasons people have trouble believing is maybe kind of this intellectual, materialistic, scientific mindset. Here's what they say. We, we can't believe in miracles. Back then, it was a whole different reason. Back then, though, here's the deal. They didn't believe because of some materialistic idea, but in the Greco-Roman world and in that culture, people actually believed that the physical was bad. They believed the body was bad. So just considering the idea of a bodily resurrect resurrection was ridiculous, even in some Jewish sects. For example, if you go to the book of Acts chapter 17, you have Paul preaching and what he's trying to do is he's preaching the gospel to these philosophers at what's called Mars Hill in Athens. And they're listening and they're moved by him and they're, they're allowing him to talk and he's speaking eloquently. And then suddenly he says this, resurrection from the dead. And he proclaims Jesus was raised from the dead. And that was the end of the sermon. That was it. Everybody just started to sneer, laugh, explode. And he didn't even get to finish the message because back then it was an absurdity. In those days, the idea of physical resurrection was every bit as ridiculous as it is today. We have to understand this. The idea that we're modern and progressive people, we can't believe in it. But back then they could believe in it is not true at all. People back then were absolutely just as much against it as Luke points this out to us. And we see that even the disciples didn't believe. This is what's so beautiful about Luke's testimony is he's not fabricating. You could tell because he does not make the disciples look very good, nor himself. In verse 10, he says, now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, he, he, he's, he's helping them understand that you have actual names. 
It's not just, he doesn't just say random women in general or apostles in general. He's trying to build an apologetic for the resurrection by saying, mentioning people like Joanna, which we know Joanna was the wife of the administrator of Herod. You can read that in Luke 8, 3. We also meet Mary Magdalene, a reformed prostitute, Mary, the mother of James. And here's why this is important and what a beautiful apologetic is. He didn't say people in general, but he's trying to say these people by name. You can talk to them, go ask them. And every year around this time we see in the media and the newspapers, there'll be some kind of scholar that steps up and says things like, well, the gospels were written many years ago after the events of Jesus. We don't even know if there's an empty tomb. We don't know whether or not they're actually eyewitnesses or resurrects. For all we know, these are legends that are written by the church later to bolster their position. The problem is at the time, the church was the lowest of the low. There was no power. There was no prestige. There was no money in this, only death. So what's the premise there? What they're saying is this, thousands of people read and read these public documents, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, we know was written 15 to 20 years after the account. And many people say, well, well, that's a long time afterwards. But in antiquity and looking at writings, that is such a short amount. It's long for us because when I talk to like my kids, a meme that's a month old is like, oh my gosh, that's so all. <laughs> but to actually be able to verify what was happening and even within the Corinthian church, what was happening within these letters going around, listen, they read it and they had to substantiate it. Listen, this is not a big area or they're proclaiming some far out cave in another part of the, the world where Jesus was risen. There was no body. If they had a body alone, it would stifle and shut everything up. There was no body. And you could, even from Asia Minor, just a couple of days journey to Jerusalem, you could substantiate, you could ask questions. I mean, even today, many of us who were born just 40 years ago, 45 years ago, which would be the latest of some of these texts, you could substantiate things that happened. Here's the first point, and it's this simple. This is why we can understand and acknowledge what Luke is trying to do and appreciate that he's giving this apologetic. And again, as we said, even the disciples didn't believe. We read in verse 11, but these words seem to them, this is the, the 11 at this point. And it says, and they did not believe them. The disciples didn't believe. They thought it was all nonsense. Now we know there've been dozens and dozens of little groups who have claimed that their founder was God. Dozens before Jesus, dozens after Jesus. There's, there's been a lot, but the, here's the deal. You can't name any of them right now. Why? Because there's been no substance to that claim. There is a body. They might say my founder is God, but without the evidence, you do not get what we have today. Now you might get a little like tiny, emotional, needy group who will believe it even today in Jerusalem, uh, in Israel, there are, there are whole sets of people that believe certain amounts of people or this one particular prophet is God and all of these kind of things, but you don't get the widespread numbers, the change in culture in just 200 years. You don't get the millions of followers now. You don't get a Thomas record going, I won't believe until I see it. And then he shouts out when Jesus shows up, my Lord and my God. The only possible explanation is that he's risen, but oftentimes we treat him as if he's dead. And when we do that, we're actually flying in the face of what Luke is trying to do. We, we use what's called chronicle snobbers, chronological snobbery. We're smarter than they were. But they might not know what an antibiotic was, but they don't have a 50 IQ. Many of them knew several languages. They were not dumb. They understood. And we cannot be chronologically too astute. In fact, I don't think we're very smart nowadays anyways. <laughs> I have a hard time believing in evolution only because I see more 
devolution. Um, we're turning into monkeys, I feel like. We're turning into animals uh, more than anything nowadays. Here's what the angels say, remember, they say this. If you believe this was just a legend, but Jesus was a good man, you're never gonna find him that way, ladies. He's talking to the, the women. You might be a good person, you might become a disciplined person, but listen, if you don't believe in a risen Jesus, you won't be a Christian. Christianity is not reformation through conforming to some kind of ideal. It's not reformation alone, it's transformation through relating to a living Lord. That's the first mistake we tend to make and that they made. They didn't actually expect a miracle. They thought he'd be in the tomb. And I think we treat him the same way oftentimes. The next thing, not only denying the miracle, but denying the very meaning of the resurrection. What I mean by this is, I think it's interesting that the angel says this here. Thank you, God bless you. I've been, I've been sick this whole week, so powering through. When the angels meet them, when they're there, they're kind of dumbfounded. They say, he's resurrected. You don't believe it. Why didn't you expect it? They say, the reason you don't understand the resurrection, the reason you didn't expect the resurrection is you didn't understand his death. Look at what it says. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, remember, Mufasa, remember. <laughs> While he was still in Galilee, remember guys, remember, remember that the son of man, notice this word, must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day and rise. And they remembered his words. Right away, they start to talk about it. And what do they say? You, you didn't even understand, not that he was gonna die, but that he must die. Listen, this is the meaning of the resurrection. And this one hurts. I'm gonna be honest. And, and, and the gospel, the good news, always is good news, but it does start with a piercing to us. Because the piercing is that I put him there. My actions. It's easy to blame Adam and Eve. It's easy to blame my parents. It's easy to blame my grandparents, the government, Trump, Obama. I don't care who you are. I'm going to point fingers, but me? I put him there? Let me put it in a nutshell. These women are a lot like us today in the church. A lot of people, we come on Easter morning, we do believe in the miracle of resurrection. We have no reason not to. We're just like, sure, got it. Maybe you've done the study. Maybe you've read the books. I believe in the resurrection. But like the women, they knew he had to die, but they didn't understand and know that he must die specifically for them. And this is what the angels say. You, you, you didn't know that he must, that he had to. You didn't understand his de death to them was just one more example of Jesus being a really great man, one of those men you wanna follow, like you follow on Twitter, you follow on Instagram, so you wanna be like them. Do you know though, that he had a more impact than that? Even in his death, it made them wanna honor his memory, live maybe sacrificially, we need to be like that. But they didn't understand the full reasoning of his death and resurrection. Maybe they believed all they needed, like we do, is a really good example. They understood Christianity to just be, be good, try to be like Jesus, try to live for Jesus. And that, a lot of us, is our only understanding of Christianity. That doesn't pierce our heart, that inspires us, but it's not the beginning not just to live like him or for him. That's all these women understood. They understood that he died for them. They didn't understand 
that he had to. And this is an extremely kind of insulting statement if you think about it, what the angel said. To say that Jesus didn't die as an example like other people, but he had to die as a sacrifice means that all of your serving him is not gonna be good enough. You're too sinful. You can't be good enough. You're too guilty. Why do you feel guilt? Because you're guilty. He had to die for you and me. If you don't like that idea, you're making the same mistake as the women did. Do you believe, well, I don't really believe Jesus actually had to die. All I know is I think any really good person who lives like Jesus and lives for Jesus, surely that'll be good enough. And the angels say, no, that's not it. This is the reason why, and we've got to see the difference. Before they understood what the angels said, before the angels got their theology all straight, before the angels showed them Jesus had to die for them, they were that lost because all of their serving and all of their good works would never ever save them. Before that, in a sense, when they were kind of just flattering themselves that they could live a good life, could satisfy God, they would just look to their religion you see them walking really slowly to the tomb, being good people with the spices, of course, being very, very honoring, way better than those men disciples who wouldn't even go to the tomb. They're honoring his memory. But listen, when the angels spoke and shared the good news that he must die, that he's not here, why are you looking for the living among the dead? When they understood that, remember they said, we remember, and they stopped trudging to the funeral, and they started running to tell the gospel. Changed everything. It's very possible for us to be just like those women and men, to be around Jesus and not get it. The angels don't say to them, my dear sisters, I wanna give you new knowledge. What you need is a new insight. Let me just tell you something. Instead, what he said, it's my dear sisters, the reason your religion is a grind, the reason you're all burdened down is because you've never understood the gospel. You thought he died just as an example and you're trying to just emulate him. No, he died as your substitute. He didn't die as your example. He died as your savior. And now you're completely saved through him. That changes you from grudgingly walking to sprinting in your journey with God. As I say, he didn't just die for you, but he died as you. He died for your sins, not just to cover over, but to make you a new person completely, to make you from grudgingly walking to sprinting into the throne room of God and sharing that with everyone you can. You know, a lot of people who just walk around like this trudging, still thinking they have to earn their salvation, that they'll do enough for God to say, good job. And here's a couple of signs that I've seen and this is going to hurt. Tighten your belt. Do you live in self-pity? Do you feel like this? I, you know, I lived a really good life. My life's not going the way it should go. What's wrong with God? Life, it's not fair. God's not fair. Your life is a grind. And you know why? because you think you actually deserve this life. Happy resurrection. You think you deserve a better life than you're actually getting. And you don't live as if Jesus had to die for you. See the difference? He had to die because I was so sinful and guilty. Not, I was, I'm, I'm no hill to Hitler. Like we love to compare ourselves to Hitler. Of course. But what about my sin? He had to die 
See, when you understand this, you're, you're alive in Christ and you, and you live very differently. I don't deserve anything through Jesus Christ, but I'm embraced and crowned with glory and honor because of him. I have him. I got the best thing. And that gets rid of this self-pity. It gets rid of this grind and the trudge. It puts wings on your feet and the wind at your back. It makes you look at everything differently, like a new creature, not like the old one, like a resurrected creature, not like a dead one. On the other hand, let me give you another one, not just self-pity, but maybe self-abuse and self-loathing. People walk all the time and people say something bad and they just feel like, look, I'm such a failure. When you, when you fail, like in just a little bit, you have this perfectionism where you feel terrible and I can't do anything. I can't even go to church. Why would I even get up? Why would I go to the altar? Why would I ask for prayer? Because I'm just horrible. And you're always beating yourself up. What's going on? You have this kind of spiritual inferiority complex and it comes from this belief that if I could just live better, if I could just live like Christ or live for Christ, but I'm not living up to it, you still don't understand that he had to die for you. You need to be able to say this, look, I was so sinful and yet Jesus died. I mean so much to him that he was willing, listen, to lose the universe rather than lose me. He was willing to lose his father rather than lose me. He was willing to be cut off rather than lose me. That impetus creates a love that is astonishing. Until you see the centri centrality of the death of Christ, until you see the death of Christ is your confidence before God, not just this model or an example, but Jesus is your substitute, your personal savior. You're seeking the living among the dead until you see it. But there's a third group of people. Remember the first point, I said the first way you can really make this mistake like they did and treat Jesus as if, he's, as if he's dead is if you don't believe in the miracle of salvation. And some people in here, not me, I'm good. Why, why do you think I'm here on Easter? Okay. Second, said the way you still treat Jesus as a dead founder is by trying to earn your own salvation. Around our culture, you always have a number of people in the first group struggling with it. But then there's always the second group who maybe that believes the basic doc doctrines, but you're actually struggling with the gospel still. And your love is cold because you're trying to earn that love. There's a difference between bad religion and true relationship with God. But maybe as I wrap up, you're in the third category and that's denying the spiritual reality of the resurrection. Maybe you're saying, I, I mean, I, I believe he's resurrected. I got the gospel down but you don't necessarily sense him, his presence. You don't feel him. In fact, you might think as long as I just think right, I'll be right. But there's something about the gospel and the presence of Jesus that you must experience him to. Not only experience, it's not all about feeling, but never throw the baby out with the bathwater. That experience is needed as well. Maybe you kind of treat God like you go before the grave, you, you put the flowers down, you shed a tear. It's really inspiring, it's really moving, but it's still, it's not personal. You're not really sensing God. And here's what I want to help you. Maybe you're not allowing the Lord to be that very present help in your time of need. In the midst of our distraction and our culture and our constant need for entertainment or purpose that really ends up purposeless. Psalm 34 says this, taste and see that the Lord is good. I love the great pastor and theologian, Jonathan Edwards talks about this verse and he says this, why do I need to taste and see? Why does it the psalmist just Tell the reader, the Lord is good. Know that he's good. Know in your, in your head. Isn't it enough just to know God is good? But the psalmist says this, because they know he's good. 
but knowing in the head is not always enough. The same thing, I, I might know he's risen, I believe he's risen, but to even believe like why he's risen. Easter pushes us beyond just agreeing and believing that he's a living reality, that he's very present right now. I know in my life, it's, it's easy to look to believe the right thing or so many Christians I see that are just like, I, I can't help another Christian because I don't know enough. And it's like, you have a testimony. You know what God has done in your life. And how many of us have really just sought after the presence of God to not just know that he's God, but to taste and see that he is good and allow his presence to overwhelm us. See, this is what the disciples ended up when the Holy Spirit came down on them. There was an immediate reaction. There was an experience of God's presence that we need. There was this feeling of God within the person that believed in Jesus, believed in the resurrection, but needed the presence and the spirit of God that he promised would be with us forever. And you need that as you're driving in the car and honking at someone on 59, you need the presence of God to help you, to know he is with you as you go into a place you know you're not supposed to or think thoughts or on a computer where you're not supposed to. You don't realize you have a living Savior living within you and talking to you. And that conviction is not to harm you, but to say, why are you bringing me in this with you? I'm a very present help. Don't get numb. Taste and see. Do you remember when you were young, just in love or looking for love or looking for passion or believing that one day you're gonna do great things and as we get older, we start to go, oh, that's just not real anymore. And Jesus comes into our life and he says, I'm giving you purpose and I'm giving you life and I'm giving you my presence. And what happens? We sense that, but then we get older and we go, oh, that's just for young people. And God says, no, that's for people that forgot that we serve a living God. You're still serving a dead God, this living God wants to continue to empower you, to be like those women that came like this and left like this, because one of the greatest ways you know that you're not serving a dead God, a dead founder, but a living founder, is you take that message of the gospel to your heart and then you have to tell people about it. You have to share that good news. You look for ways to get to God. And those people think you're crazy. How can you believe in this stuff? Because I know my living God, he's not dead. He's living in me and he's pushing me because what you're living on is dead. You're living for your career and it will die. You'll get higher, but it won't fulfill. You're living for another spouse while you're lusting over this person and it won't fulfill. It's only gonna kill you. You're living for a dead God and I serve a living God. Resurrection Sunday. I wanna challenge you this, this year, a year from now, what does it look like to really walk in step with what the Spirit of God is doing? and seriously seek Him. I think what we call revival happening around the nation is just normal Christian life in the scripture. People repenting, loving one another, forgiving, giving themselves to Jesus, and it's starting a fire like it did at the beginning. That's normal everyday Christian life. What would it look like for us to be the people that served and proclaimed and lived as if our King was risen? Let's pray. Father, thank you.